So you're in Georgetown. Tell me about Chuck Gustafson. <laughs> uh, he's a fantastic guy. Um, I think one of the, the one of the joys of having been a student there and now being able to teach there is the fact that the faculty are just amazing individuals who've done tremendous work both in practice but also in academia. And so it's uh, it's a pleasure and honor to call him a colleague. So um, I thank him for having me there. Well, Mark, uh, he's just joined the Jackson Center. He's a Jamestown High School graduate, good friends with our current Chairman of the Boards, Stan Lundy. Robert Jackson mean anything to you? So I think he means a lot to me personally, just because I was very fortunate after I finished law school um, to go off to Europe on a Fulbright scholarship uh, with the Northern American Foundation. And uh, through luck and serendipity, uh, wound up meeting the U.S. Ambassador. And because of that conversation, wound up serving as the um, as a, a member of her delegation to the U.N. Uh, Panama 103 Lockerbie trial. And then because of that job, I uh, got lucky again and got hired on as the most baby kind of young pro prosecutor at the War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague. And any prosecutor who starts in The Hague is instructed to read Jackson's uh, opening statement, mm. um, which as alluded to, I guess yesterday, the day before, is the greatest statement ever read in the courtroom. <laughs> and so I think that anyone who has that experience, particularly someone as you know, fortunate as I have been to have that as like my first real job. I mean, I worked at a, a big law firm briefly, but then when I'm going off to Europe, um, it has a tremendous impact. Uh, in fact, it, uh, even so much so if, you know, I'm not sure if you're on Facebook, but on Facebook, you're, one of the things you can put down is your favorite quotes. Um, and so I have three favorite quotes, and one of them is from Justice Jackson. No kidding. So um, I think it's been hugely impactful. Which one is it? Sorry, it's the part of the opening statement. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a very severance fence here at, at the Jackson, and we'll be trying to do something down in Georgetown because of Chuck, so. Fantastic. Stay loose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you've been here before. Right? This is my first time. First time? Yeah, yeah. What, what's David's been very, David's been very kind to invite me in the past. It just never quite worked out schedule-wise. Yeah. What's your um, impression of all this stuff? I'm impressed by. I mean, it it takes a lot to bring a, so many people from such in, important institutions to one place anywhere. The fact that it's here, I think, is a testament to the folks that are running this. That you know, engage people to such a high level that they find it important to come. Um, you know, I was. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be invited to the World Economic Forum meetings in Davos, which is a little ski town up in the Alps. If you were to have another conference of fancy people, you would never think about putting it in this little tiny ski town in the Alps because it's a hassle to get to. But it's there and it's there every year. Um, and so I think that it's a testament to the folks here that people have come over and over again um, to, to be part of this community. And I think that it's both the, the, the history of Justice Jackson, but also the community that's been formed. You know, this committee could, community could meet anywhere, but it continues to keep coming back here, which I think is a testament to the people involved. So um, thank you and to all your colleagues for having us here. Well, we're delighted, glad to have talent like you here. Uh, were you destined to be a lawyer? <laughs> My plan was to be a fighter pilot, um, but I had poor eyesight, so it didn't work out. So I went to law school. So um, yeah, it was not intentional at all. Where'd you go? Uh, I went to Georgetown, okay. and then I went to uh, Europe and studied at Leiden University in the Netherlands, and then went to the Hague Academy of International Law afterwards. Who was, uh, who was your, the, when you were at the Hague, who was the chief prosecutor of the? It was Carl de Ponte was the chief prosecutor, mm -hmm. and then the first trial I worked on was um, the Christchurch case, ah. um, one of the Srebrenica cases, and so I worked for uh, Mark Harmon, Peter McCloskey, uh, Andrew Cayley, who's here, uh, and Magic Karen Terjiakis and myself. So that was the trial team. Mark Harmon was here last year, I believe. Uh -huh. Uh, we never had Carla Lapante. Carla mm -hmm. uh, what was she like? She's a fascinating individual. Um, there are a lot of folks that had challenges with her. I only had positive experiences with her. Um, my first time to go into court in the robe and the bib, which was a big deal um, back in the day, particularly since I was the most junior person, um, was because of her and Mark Harmon, frankly. And um, I think it's the, the fact that they were able to see past age and let the person who had been working on it for a while to actually be part of that was a tremendous testament both to her and to Mark Harmon, who is the one that teed it up for her to say yes. Um, so I have only positive things to say about my engagement with her. What was your walk, how long were you in the court system? I was there, there for about three years. Three years. When you walked away from it, what was your takeaway? After three years seeing the process, uh, and, and a relatively new process, I mean, this mm -hmm. is all 
I, so I think I was very fortunate to be in The Hague um, at a moment where I would suggest would be the kind of pinnacle of international justice. You know, it was the first genocide trial in Europe. It was the first trial of the head of state. It was the opening of the ICC. Um, it was a very amazing moment in time. The world was generally at peace. Um, there was bandwidth for Syrian policymakers to care and to be passionate about this issue and budget to go behind it. Um, and I think we were very fortunate to be there at that time. At the same time, on kind of a junior staffer side, it was unique to be in a place where there's very much a mission mentality. Um, people you know, left their family and their kids to go there generally for a short period of time to try to accomplish something. And I think one of the things that international law has to grapple with now, grapple with now is the fact that it's, now it's, a, it's an office building, right? Like people can be there for life. Um, it's, it's lost that mission mentality. Um, now it's a job and it's kind of an, another kind of UN type institution, where I'm, I'm referring to the ICC, where it, it, that energy and passion that pushes things through, which you really need, I think can get lost. Because you, know, you show up, you have your holiday time, you go to work, and you kind of do it over again. Um, and I think that's something that's it's going to be hard to replicate from the ad hoc tribunals, um, from places that you know, are obviously very much reflected here, with David in particular, his, his service, where people are roughing it. You know, they're doing it for, because it's a passion behind them, as opposed to because it's lifetime employment and it pays relatively well. Um, you know, for folks like me, you know, I took a $100,000 pay cut to go work for the War Crimes Tribunal. So I did it because I wanted to. Um, it did not do it because it bettered my career in the States. You know, American lawyers, as you know, are not going to be more excited because you spent a bunch of years living in Europe uh, drinking cappuccinos as far as they're concerned, right? Like how do you increase your billing rate based upon the experience there? That's, that's hard to say. So when I came back to, to uh, this big law firm, um, I did not get full credit for my three, three years abroad. They gave me one year's credit, which is what I negotiated to be a Fulbright Scholar. Um, which meant I didn't have to necessarily do anything. I just got a year's credit for it. Um, and the fact that I was, you know, writing motions and you know working with heads of state and doing like real legal work was kind of irrelevant to the legal profession here in the states. Um, and I think that as people make choices in terms of where they're going to go, um, I think that the challenge for kind of international justice now is how to maintain that mission mentality um, with a group of people who you know may not be there for the mission all the time, mainly because it's a great job choice. Um, and that's going to be a hard question. So you're at Georgetown, one of the preeminent law schools. Uh, we are represented here by uh, various other law schools. Many of them have international criminal law uh, sections uh, within the law school. How do they convince students that there's a job market when the day is done? Um, listen, I think that it, if the job market you're referring to is for intra public international law, there's never been a large job market for it. You know, the people who are very lucky to practice in this field are very lucky to practice in this field. Right. You know, I spent lunch today with a handful of students talking about, you know, what they want to do and how to get into the business. Um, and, you know, as I told one of the students, I'm like, I think people's advice largely reflects their personal experience. And so my personal advice is, you know, go to a great law school, graduate with honors, go to a great law firm, you know, kill yourself for a few years, prove that you are really good at your craft, at your profession, and then take life from there. Because, you know, when I was helping do hiring in The, in the Hague, you know, there are lots of fantastic people who have followed their hearts um, to do, you know, human rights type work at whatever MGO, which is incredibly important. But when I was looking for folks, like the folks that I was going to pass on to the boss saying we need to hire these people or, you know, these, you know interview these people, you know, it's folks that have, um, you know, hard skills. Either they spend a lot of time in the courtroom, they spend a lot of time at a top tier firm, and they've killed themselves to work really, really hard because when it comes down to it, there's, there's very little bandwidth for folks who aren't carrying their weight in these tribunals. Um, not everyone comes from the same background. And so, if, particularly if you're going to hire someone from a common law background who is a native English speaker, there are not many spots for that type of human being. And so, every one of those people has to be fantastic. Um, and so, I am more likely to, you know, kind of push forward a CV for someone who went to a great law school, who graduated with honors, who was on law review, or did something else that has, you know, a background and a passion for the topic, but. At 
the bottom line I feel is going to work nights, weekends, and holidays in order to join. When I joined the tribunal, it's because I interviewed with a guy named uh, Peter Mikulski, fantastic guy, like a prosecutor's prosecutor. Um, he said, listen, I know you're a Gibson Dunn. Uh, I know the firm. Uh, if you come here, I need Gibson Dunn nights, weekends, on holidays. I need a slave. If you want to be a slave, the job is yours. And so I'll be a slave. <laughs> and that was our working arrangement. Yeah. And I worked my tail off. And so that's how I entered. And therefore, any person that I was you know, helping try to bring in, that's the conversation I had with them. Um, because you, know, you have major investigations in the states. You have much longer, larger trial teams, much, you know, more investigators, more staff for cases that you know, aren't genocide. Um, and so everyone needs to, to really be in the fight all the time. So you were part of really the first genocide trial uh, for the camera. How did that end up? Uh, so, I mean, the trial, I think, was a tremendous success. You know, he convicted Christchurch on genocide. Um, he got a, a, a sentence that for an American from California, where, you know, we have a death penalty in California. The fact that, you know, he was not given a life sentence by, which was the top sentence one could get there, um, was frustrating. That said, he got 42 years, 43, um, and that for, for him, effectively, is a life sentence. Um, from other folks from different legal um, kind of backgrounds, you know, our chief investigator is from France. You know, in France, the top sentence you can really get is generally 20 years. So the fact that this perpetrator got twice what is the maximum sentence effectively in France, he was thrilled by. You know, for survivors um, of this genocide, like they of course were very upset because it's there's no number of years you could give that brings back their loved ones. And so I think the strength of the international system is we all approach it from different ways and we find the goodness of with the judgment that we got. You know, for the lawyer inside of me, this is the first genocide conviction we had in The Hague, which is tremendously important. You know, before we went to the, um, before we had the judgment um, to kind of prepare myself for it, um, I spent time both in Auschwitz and in Schindernberg. Um, so, you know, basically took off you know, either weekends and went out just to kind of see what the history of this was and to feel it firsthand. And I'll be honest, like when I went back to The Hague after those two trips, like I wasn't confident we were going get, to get, get a conviction, fix, conviction because you know, that's, that's the case that we had before that in, in Europe. Um, and so I think it's a testament to you know, the lawyers involved, the, you know, the investigators, and frankly the witnesses, that, but for them we would have no sense of justice that we were doing on their behalf. Um, so I feel very fortunate to have had the time there. And one of the things that I, you know, I was just on a trip recently and someone we were having a conversation about this and they said, you know, why did you do all this work? And I said, listen, it's, it's a passion. You see that from everyone I'm sure you've interviewed for this series. Um, and David Crane was just saying that when he was um, working his job, he would spend a lot of time doing outreach and talking to you know, kind of survival groups. And we did the same thing in, in the Shormitsa case. And you know, after they'd be very angry and upset for us not prosecuting enough people, and the fact that judges were you know, sentences were not long enough. After all of that, when we were leaving, they'd say, "But thank you for doing what you're doing, because but for you, we would see no justice." That's incredibly powerful. Yeah. And giving witness and audience to people who've had their entire lives taken from them, it, it's hard to explain how important I think that is for those individuals. Um, and I feel very fortunate that I was, happened to be one of those people that got to have that role. So thank you for having us here and thank you for the interview.